Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, thank you for inviting me to, to speak here in my modest attempts at precision farming. Um, as Ian has said, I run Broadstream Farming. It's based on, a fam on some family-owned land, uh, some of which is rented, some is owned. And in the, in the few previous years, I've expanded the business to up, up to the hectare you see now. We've got a huge variety of soil types. I've got some, some beautiful heavy clay silt on Romney Marsh that we, we look after, right up to some really nasty clay clap, clay cap, flinty soil on the top of the North Downs uh, and an isolated um, pocket. There's a location of where we are, an isolated pocket. We've got the, down in the bottom there is the, is the, the good soil. We've got uh, uh, some down, chalky, downy, downland type soil and gawk clay there. Got some fairly nasty downland soil up at the top. And then I've got a beautiful small seam of brick earth up there, which is an absolute pleasure to work on. The, the various different farms that I look after, we run different rotations. We don't run the whole, uh, from a cropping point of view, an agronomic point of view, we don't run the whole acreage as one unit. We have different rotations to, uh, to pick up the various different needs of the, of the farms. Down on the Romney Marsh, the, the bit of land at the bottom, we're running a six-year cereal-based rotation uh, with a view to controlling uh, resistant blackgrass, uh, which we have done through a combination of spring cropping um, and later drilling uh, selective agronomy to the point where we are now uh, not using Atlantis at all in our rotation. The other rotations are basically set to maximise output for, for, the, for the farmers and landlords that I look after. In terms of machinery, I have a main line run of machinery. I have a large tractor, a large set of discs, a top down, a large plough, a big combine uh, and a large Vardastat drill. But what I've learned over the last five to six years is that one pass doesn't fit all. And I'm now starting to bring in much smaller supporting machinery, smaller items like a small three meter power harrow combination. I've also got a time drill. We've got uh, a small set of uh, a small carrier disc rather than a large one. All these slightly smaller items where we can tread lighter on the soil and we can make more of an application uh, to, our, to the fields. Our mainline sprayer, again, we've got one big John Deere sprayer, but uh, in the last five years I've brought in another sprayer to support that in our, our busier times. It seems to me that attention to detail is, is utmost. In terms of precision farming equipment, I've got four John Deere panels, uh, 2600 panels. In fact, I've just upgraded one to, to, to a newer panel. We run an end sensor, which has the top con, I do all our cultivations to uh, Starfire 1 accuracy and drilling and spraying to Starfire 2 accuracy. We've got a new combine this last season, which is um, RTK. The RTK, though, uh, is only available in certain areas, so we, we fall back to, a, to an SF2 equivalent signal after that. Both the sprayers incorporate auto section control and auto track. Um, and the 5430i, the big John Deere self-propelled, has the boom track option which keeps the boom at a set distance from the ground or the canopy from the target. And all of the data that um, I collect with these machines uh, I put together on, on, uh, on a gatekeeper program. Um, my journey into precision farming can be summed up by, the, sadly, the late Professor Colin Spedding from Reading, who was a lecturer of mine. He was a collector of proverbs. Uh, and in relation to precision farming, I think he summed it up nicely. And the, the early bird catches the worm, but that's actually the second mouse gets the cheese. And I think I've been the early bird on a lot of it, um, but now I'm starting to realise that being the second mouse um, can actually be more, more useful. I started thinking about precision farming in 1999 um, in discussions with a local, uh, at that time, a local, fa local um, precision farming company, Farm Image. Um, about scanning the fields, EC scan, electrical conductivity scanning of the fields. And it took a, took a good three years to persuade me to do it. Uh, and the first scans I did in 2002, uh, I picked two of the most extreme fields, one on top of some really nasty flinty soil and one down on the marsh where I thought it was uh, a beautiful, uniform and fertile um, platform. And since then, I've uh, been pleased with the results and have built up to having the whole farm scanned and as and when we are fortunate enough to take on new land, uh, try and get that scanned in, in the first few years that we're, we're in there. In 2006, I bought a new combine, a Lexian combine, 
uh, which came with yield mapping. And that's really where I fell into the yield mapping. Uh, I thought it was fantastic. We started collecting data manically. And I sat down in the winter and looked at it and, and, and slightly scratched my head. In 2007, I took on an N sensor, um, an ALS N sensor. Again, we started collecting, manically collecting data. And I've got a laptop full of biomass um, scans from, from many years, including a 26-mile scan of some of the major roads in East Kent <laughs> when we forgot to turn it off. And in 2008, uh, machinery policy meant that I had to replace two tractors and I had a uh, very old faithful sprayer that died completely. So I had to buy a new sprayer. I took the opportunity to make sure that the tractors were Green Star ready, and that they were auto track um, equipped. And uh, the John Deere sprayer, of course, is the full, uh, has the full um, intelligence package. I bought the panels at the same time and that's where we really started launching into guidance. I believe in my business that the, the precision farming for me is in, in five sections. The first two sections are, are very, very linked. They're all linked somehow, um, but nevertheless, they're all slightly separate. This is some of our first soil EC mapping we did, and that shows very clearly the change in the soil types. What it doesn't show you is that there's a gradient. We have a high point there running down into a valley and then back up to a high point. And when you stand in the farmyard and look at this field, you can clearly see white chalk, lovely dark brick earth, white chalk. So it, it's sort of pretty obvious. In the good old days, I used to go diligently go out and do a lovely W-shaped pattern soil test of the field. And I'd start in the corner near the farmyard and I'd go up and down and up and down and uh, be very pleased with myself, send it away, get some measurements back. Once we'd had this field zoned and tested, we discovered that I was actually doing the field a disservice and that there were some significant areas that were much better than the average W sample had been indicating. So we've been able to save, save some fertiliser on there by targeting it, um, particularly with a P, P and K. It also made me look at some of my historic soil sampling and I realised that actually doing it myself in all weathers or not in all weathers or doing it from the door of a Land Rover or a quad bike was giving me some fairly inconsistent results. So having the professionals do it has brought some consistency to the, seal, to the soil results. What we do with those results is then we bring it together into a, into a range of zones. These are, this is a field down on the marsh. Um, it's a, a, a very, very nice field. Um, and it, it became very apparent that we were seeing some distinct zones. And we're treating it for PK, lime and magnesium very differently. I'd always thought our fields on the marsh were very uniform, but the reality is there are subtle variations. And where the uh, conditions aren't quite as good, we've, we see a drop off in performance far quicker than we would do in some slightly uh, less fertile soil. And we've built these up into, into whole farm maps. Uh, and what we have here is, is a whole farm, uh, I think that's a phosphate, a phosphate application map which is great and it's very interesting, but what I'm seeing there when I look at it in detail, I'm seeing soil type, I'm seeing drainage, I'm seeing past field boundaries, many, many legacy features. Um, and I have to remind myself that it's no surprise that some fields are called Starve Acre uh, and it's no surprise that Maxim Field produces, always produces a good crop. So I wonder if we're slightly reinventing the wheel and a bit of historic perspective would be useful in a precise way. We've done for a number of years now precise variable lime application. And the thing I like about that is, again, it's, it's clearly targeted at the areas that aren't performing. And certainly the heavier soil, the quicker the performance drop off in, a, in, a, in, in an inconsistent pH situation. It's reduced traffic uh, in terms of getting the, the, the lime on there and getting the lime spread. In the good old days, we'd have put a thin covering over the whole field not actually tackle the problem in the, in the areas. It means that we can be quicker in there with cultivations after the lime spread has been. Really, it's taught me to look at the, the, the areas that, of, that have an obvious problem. It makes sense that you treat those areas differently. 
Um, and if precision farming can help you when you're field walking to pick out these areas, at least you can go out and monitor them and truth them, whether that be with a spade, a mini digger or a, a soil test. In 2008, I took on the N-Sensor. The reason at that time I chose the N-Sensor is I really enjoyed and really liked the ease of use, the on, on and off ability of it. You can set it up in the yard, you can send someone out there, and all they have to do is turn it on and it does the job. It does the job on the fly, it doesn't rely on anyone else looking at the crops. It's not hampered by conditions. The, the ALS version particularly is not hampered by varying light through the day. It's really good, it really seems to work. And Another, another important aspect for me is I can handle the data through Gatekeeper in my own office. I'm not necessarily reliant on someone else. For me as a contractor, though, the downside is that I find it very difficult to pass that cost on. Uh, and it would uh, sometimes, in some situations, that it, it, the cost, if I was able to do a, a remote sensing such as soil sense, I could put the cost to the agreement and not necessarily carry the cost as a contractor. But that, that's a minor detail. We tend to use our N-Sensor as an agronomic tool. We pretty much know what we want to do with the plant. We just use the N-Sensor to um, action that. When we do, and when we've decided what we wanted to do, we let it have its head. There's no point in investing a machine if you don't let it do what it's good at. We decide the rates, but we let the, the N-Sensor decide the maximum and minimum parameters. And essentially what happens is um, it reads the biomass, and I'm sure as previous speakers have said, it reads the biomass and then applies fertilizer given several constraints according to the biomass. This is the biomass for an oilseed rape crop in February. As you can see, it's fairly mottled, it's fairly inconsistent. Um, a, a, number of the, a number of the areas are, um, would be noisy data from, from the operation. Um, but what we see once we've had two applications of fertilizer is that we brought that biomass up. It still looks a little bit mottled, but actually when you look at the, the values of that data, it's much more even. Have we saved any fertilizer? I don't know, maybe a few thousand litres, but no more. What we do with the um, end sensor, we set it to optimise biomass and yield, we don't set it to save fertilizer. The great thing about a variable N application system is it brings you enormous crop evenness. And what we've discovered over the last few years, particularly in high disease pressure years, is that it evens the growth stage up, leads to very, very precise leaf emergence, which means that we can target our fungicides very, very accurately. Uh, and it particularly this last year, it, it, it was very, very telling that we were spraying um, some of our high output uh, first wheat milling crops. We were getting the timings to within 12 hours and we were treating fields individually rather than as blocks. And I have to say, on some of our, our more at-risk varieties, it saved the day last year, and we were still achieving above-average yield, whereas many of my neighbours with similar crops has, have had some of the worst years in their history. The other spin-off with the N-Sensor is it has reduced our wet areas almost completely. What tends to happen is it's, is it's difficult to establish crop in these wet areas. You do get a little bit of seed in there. The end sensor spots its weak, feeds it appropriately. The crop gets better. It draws more moisture out. You can then subsoil, blah, blah, blah. The cycle goes on, and our wet spots have virtually disappeared. They ponded again this year, but they've disappeared very quickly, and the crop's still alive. The other spin-off is that we've gone into an era of greater combining efficiency. With a modern combine and its various uh, technological advances, we, we what we found in, in our wheat crops, particularly where we get the evenness absolutely perfect, is the combine, you can push it to its maximum efficiency, you can minimise the losses, you can take away some of the driver fatigue by allowing the combine to do its job properly with its smart cruise, cruise control or whatever it happens, happens to be called. Yield mapping. I wonder whether, for me, it was a bit of a white elephant. It was great to have this computer, this computer in the in the class combine that collected all this wonderful data, and I'd sit in the office and I'd look at a pretty picture, and you know it would be fantastic. I'd think I'd really, really hit the big time, and I was thought I was very clever to have actually got this expensive system on a second-hand combine for no premium. So we collected manically data, much like we did with the N sensor, 
And I studied it all winter and, and became somewhat confused. This is a yield map of oil seed rape taken, clear, clearly taken at harvest. This was a field that visually looked really even. From flowering to ripening, it looked even. There were flowers, a full field of flowers. There, it, ev it, it ripened evenly. Our spray timing for the Roundup desiccation meant that the timing was right for the whole field, not just for 90% of it. And I scratched my head and I looked at it. And certainly from the combine seat, I would have said that the yield map should have been all one colour all the way over. But it's a noisy, cluttered, difficult thing to, to really understand. Where I think the noise has come from is that I don't think the yield meters in, in combine, certainly in the combine of that era, was a very good yield meter. I don't think the um, operator was mindful of the yield map when he was combining. So there are several runs um, where, uh, let's just go back, use the laser. This run here, I think, is broadly speaking a run where he's had half a header's width. But of course, the averaging of the data has, has, has slightly even messed that up. The, the, that red spot there, that is where we unloaded on the headland with the thrasher running, but no crop going through it, which recorded a zero yield. And when you sub look at subsequent years of oilseed rate maps, there's always a spot there. When you go out and look at the crop, it's a beautiful crop. There's nothing wrong. It is literally a facet of having a particular size tank, a particular combining needed to unload in a particular spot. So what we're trying to do now is, is to get the drivers to understand that not only they're combining, but they're collecting data. I skirted with off-take maps from these yield maps, but, but realistically, again, there's too much noise and clutter for them to be realistic. Guidance, however, I was led to believe was the holy grail, and I put my wallet where my mouth was, or where the dealer's mouth was, and bought loads of panels and auto track stuff uh, uh, back in 2008. You are bound to save fuel, they said. There is, we cast iron guarantee you will save fuel. I'm sure we do. What I can't do is actually, I can't really measure it. My fuel use over the last five years has averaged about 101 litres a hectare. The last two years I've hit that dead. Prior to that we were a bit below, prior to that a bit above, and in 2008 and eight, we were about there. So 2008 was when we first started using guidance. It's really hard to see whether my fuel um, consumption has gone down. The things that affect it more are things like the wetness and the dryness of the year, stuff, stuff we all know as farmers, the rotation we've picked for that year, machinery. In our search for cultural control, we've gone back to using the plough a little bit more. Um, I've also, in, within that period, bought a top-down, which has transformed our light land cultivations. I've gone from um, one type of combine to another type of combine with a slightly more efficient engine, but it's had a fantastic effect on my fuel consumption in the summer. One year, it was 2011, I used a large tractor on a chaser bin, which used a significant amount more diesel, a measurable amount more, more diesel in my yearly consumption. Intuitively, we must be saving diesel, but I just find, I'm finding it difficult to measure. Overlap. Um, when I first... Uh, back in 2006, when I first started thinking about uh, this part of precision farming, I was doing a lot of the spraying myself in, in, a, in a lovely old sand sprayer, and I noticed that there was a distinct 30 centimeter green or light patch between the tram lines. So uh, that was really what spurred me on to, to, to talk to, to, to go into guidance on the tractors. So back in 2008, I was farming 648 hectares with a 30 centimeter overlap in all crops. This was an overlap that was put in by the drill. It was put in by setting the markers. It was put in by the desire not to have any gaps. And that's a 1.25% overlap. It's not a lot, but that's, you know, these days, that's a significant amount of input costs. And, that's a, uh, and, that, and if you, with the same output, if you can reduce that cost, it just puts your cost of production down. This year, we're, we're looking after 441 hectares of very flat ground, to which we dial in on the Green Star platform. We dial in a zero overlap. We still have nearly 800 hectares that's on some fair, very undulating um, slopes, and we dial in over the tram line a 20 centimetre overlap. So it's about five, five to ten not per drill, four to five per drill width, depending on the situation. And that's reduced our overlap percentage to 0.5%. The reason why we do it on the hill is because we just find that 
the tractors cannot cope at that level of accuracy with the best will in the world when you're dealing with, with tyres that are 700 millimetres wide um, and track widths of, of, of the same and, you know, drills that weigh six to eight tonnes on side slopes. You just can't get them to pull straight, however hard you try. So we dial in a little bit over, of overlap to do that. I also have a number of farmer clients whose bedroom windows look out over some of their biggest and best wheat fields. And I don't want them waking up in the morning and looking out at a gap every morning. Um, it's not really about what we're doing for them. Our pass-to-pass -pass accuracy is much better, uh, as it, it's obvious. We're definitely covering less ground in the fields. We're getting better output, less fatigue for the drivers and operators. They are actually concentrating on what's going on behind. Um, anecdotally, we're probably destroying less machinery behind the tractors than we used to. Certainly when it comes to combining, there's much more on in-field real-time adjustment going on. One of the, uh, and talking about combining, one of the biggest uh, benefits I've seen is in, in harvest efficiency. When we're able to narrow that gap there to under 15, under 10 centimetres, and you've always got the header full, the combine runs better, it thrashes better, it's more efficient, there's less waste, there's less tail, there's less green stripes in subsequent um, crops. The operator's less tired, he combines for longer. That horrible 2 o'clock, 3 o'clock droopy eyelid feel that many of you, I'm sure, have been through, um, we're able to deal with that because he's not been so stressed out all morning trying to keep straight. And all the time you're looking at the corner of a header, you're not looking at what's going in. You're not looking at your moni yield monitors. You're not looking at your grain loss monitors. We're getting better yield maps. It actually has improved the field craft in the field. We're now planning what we're going to do with a combine. We're not taking off such big chunks when we cut out our wares. It's, it's led to a little bit of better headland management. We sat down, when we first put uh, the Star FR2 system on that combine, that's actually a six, uh, Lexian 600 with a John Deere combine, which causes much amusement to the John Deere dealer. Um, what we did was we sat down with a big bit of paper and a little key ring class combine, and we drew out the most efficient way to cut the field out, and we've reduced our headland turning significantly. The other thing it's got, it's got the combine driver talking to the trailer drivers more. So we're planning what we're doing a lot more. Uh, and I just think, if I had to, if I could only have one element of guidance, I would have it on a combine without any question. Tried variable seed rates. We borrowed a, a Kverland MSC 600 drill, which had variable rate uh, capability. And we did some trials a few years ago, which were very, very unsuccessful. I was ashamed of what we, what we did. I think the problem was that I wasn't quite ready for it. And what I had done was I'd used it to compensate for bad seedbed preparation. And what it's made me do now is variably apply my cultivations to the seedbed in order to get a good, consistent seedbed. And nothing is drilled unless either me or my manager has signed off the field. So we don't get this situation where drills are going into seedbeds that aren't uh, ready. And you tend to make your own luck, I think, there. If you, get the, if you get the cultivations right, you get the seedbed right, you get the seed placement right, you get your variety right, you get your agronomy right, then you've half grown the crop. The optimum spring plant stand seems to vary yearly. And this is, this is where I have a fundamental principle problem with variable seed rates as they were first sold to me. Your optimum spring plant stand varies from year to year, and you don't know what that is. Winter kill, we've seen winter kill reduce. Winter kill percentages are much lower than they ever used to be. And I think really, you, you just cannot predict the ideal spring plant count in the autumn, and I think you'd be a fool to. Sometimes a thinner stand, a plant stand can be better. But you don't know that until you're in that thin plant stand, until you've got to harvest. We just rattle through the slides. So, yes, you can't predict the ideal plant count. And this is a case in point. This is a field I took on last year. It is probably our worst black grass field. We managed this year 85% control. Basically what it did, it ended up in the areas where we didn't control the black grass with a much thinner plant stand and a level of black grass that I wouldn't be happy with visually. 
it made up to a tonne a hectare more yield where that black grass was. And that is purely because this last year, thinner plant stands were able to use the light, the, what little light we had much more effectively. This is the dirtiest field on the farm. It was the highest yielding field on the farm. Over the Weybridge, first week gallant, full spec, five tonnes an acre. I just think it's far easier to manage a canopy that you've created than it is to predict in the autumn your optimum spring plant stand. But I wouldn't dismiss variable seed rate, wouldn't dismiss it at all. We go back to this field, this difficult field I've got up on the downs. The chalk, the chalk areas that are yellow, much bigger winter kill. There's, it's just lower indices, it's just not as great. The bottom bit, sorry, the bottom bit, the brown bit through the middle is much richer, deeper soil. It holds the water better. It is just generally better. And we, we know that. It's obvious. So we go into this field. We get our seabed right. We get our variety right, choice right. We get our cropping right. We get our agronomy plan right. Then I think I would probably vary the seed rate. What else is precision farming done for me. I've got all sorts of data sitting at my laptop, years and years of data which I scratch my head and look at on dark winter's evenings and I just really can't make head or tail of it. But, but a number of years ago um, in this field I was out there checking for uh, flag leaf spraying timings and I noticed these linear strips where the flag leaf was rolled and not fully, it was fully emerged but it hadn't fully opened very distinct lines. So I went back and looked at several of the data sets that I'd collected and broadly speaking you can see these patterns. It's not cultivations because we never drive that way. It's not drainage because the drains run east to west. It's not tram lines because they run north to south. There's no power lines, there's no underground pipes. So I was really, really struggling with what this effect was. So I looked back at the cropping. Even on Google Earth, there are several images where it's difficult to see on this PowerPoint, but when you actually look at the, the, the real image, you can see the lines, and in subsequent Google, Google Earth images, you can see them very clearly. So I looked back at the cropping, did some investigation, turned out to be these buggers. In the late 90s, we were part of a, a, a pea vining cooperative on Romney Marsh, and I think it was 97, we had a particularly wet vining harvest, and then in 98, we had a particularly wet combining harvest. So I went out with my mini digger and had a look. And it turns out that in that field, we have deep compaction at between 35 and 40 inches below drain level or in, in amongst the drains. What, what can I do about that? I really don't know what I can do about that. I can't put a machine through that because I'll tear all the drains out. Is it having an effect? Apart from this last year, that has always been our consistently high, highest yielding field. It's our easiest to work. But what it made me do was realise that there's far more to this than just, you know, uh, there's far more to the data that I'm getting than just looking to see how, how well the crop is yielding or what the indi in indicators are for the soil. So what have I tried? Well, I've tried most things, but I think in the case of some of them, I've, I've got excited by the technology and the shininess of it and, and thought, right, this is great, now what can I do with it? put the cart before the horse. I like guidance. I think it's got a, a, a valuable place. The N sensor or any sort of variable N system, um, whether it's soil sense, N sensor, crop circle, whatever, if I didn't have an N sensor, I would have something. I think that's been invaluable to us. The soil mapping again, because the soil mapping, the soil underpins everything we do. Without the soil, we wouldn't be farming. Um, and there, there's a, I think there's a, you know, there's a great responsibility to look after it because without it we would be nowhere. Hated, perhaps that's a bit strong. I think I'm just a bit disappointed with yield mapping so far, but we are making an effort to improve prove it and trying to, to, to use it to give us some better information. Again, with variable seed rate, I think I definitely put the cart before the horse, but it's something that we will be taking up in the, in the near future, but on a slightly more... Um, a slightly more considered way. I've loved it all, loved having a go at it all, but what I've really enjoyed and what really makes me, makes me um, tick is, is it makes me look at the farm in much more detail. 
And I firmly believe that there's no future in farming unless you've got attention to detail. What do I think about the future? Having heard the previous speakers today, I, I concur with, with pretty much everything they say. The future for me lies in guidance, variable soil, variable seed rates. It lies in some aspect of yield mapping. It lies with variable N application. But I think the secret to that is, the, is new and cleverer ways to interpret that data. And the data may actually be showing you something that is completely unrelated to the method of collection. I think real-time guidance and seeing actual things, as the previous speaker has talked about, weed spot spraying, more efficient use of land up to the boundaries, more efficient um, use of headland areas, bad areas, drone machines, I all think this has a future. Assessment of soil in real time, I think, is, is probably something that, that will be most important. We have an, uh, a variable, we have an N sensor that does variable rate, N on the fly, it looks at the crop, makes an assessment, gives an application. I'd like to see something that senses soil condition, texture, moisture, and then adjusts the drill, the power harrow, the subsoiler in real time as you go through. But to my mind, it's the precision automatic targeting of inputs that will bring us the most benefits. And I hope we get there before legislation forces us to go there, because I think there'll be some real benefits. What's the best precision farming tool in my toolbox? It's feet. It's either me or James, my arable manager, going out into the field and truthing all this stuff, and looking at the plants, growing the crop. They, I mean, again, to quote a proverb, a farmer's foot is the best fertilizer. Precision farming technology is of little value without that. You need a grower's input. You need a grower's expertise. You dare I say it, you need a bit of a gut feel. It'll never replace good growing, but it'll become a more and more important and increasingly valuable tool. Thank you very much.